Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Yep. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so today I'll be talking about non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, changed the talk a little bit since last year, uh, since there have been some new new developments uh, in different treatment options. So at the end, I'll be discussing uh, pembrolizumab and uh, instiladrin. I'll start by talking about uh, the staging and natural history of bladder cancer. Repetition is always good. So uh, as you guys know, uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer represents about 70% of incident cases of bladder cancer. And uh, when we're talking about non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, it's a big spectrum because you know, we're including uh, low-grade non-invasive TA tumors, high-grade non-invasive TA tumors, um, uh, high-grade T1, and then uh, CIS, which is its own uh, different beast as well. And so uh, the majority of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer uh, is papillary non-invasive disease, um, with CIS representing about 10% of non-muscle invasive disease and high-grade T1 tumors representing uh, the remainder. Uh, just to review, um, so non-invasive means that you can see something from the intraluminal surface of the bladder, but when you re resect it, um, there's no evidence of any invasion into the lamina propria. T1, you're invading into the lamina propria, but not into the muscularis propria. Uh, and, um, and then obviously muscle invasive diseases into the muscularis propria. And CIS uh, is non-invasive disease that is uh, a flat configuration. Um, and so when you come to Memorial and you look at our pathology reports, our uh, pathologists don't even uh, often write CIS. They just say, uh, if it's non-invasive urothelial carcinoma, and then they say the pattern of growth, it's either flat for CIS or papillary for uh, a TA tumor uh, or, or both, if there's a combination. Um, so when we talk about natural history of bladder cancer, uh, the concepts of recurrence and progression. Um, so recurrence just means uh, it came back um, at some point. But progression is, uh, you know, cancer comes back, but it's uh, of a greater uh, magnitude. So it's either going from low grade to high grade, or it's going from, uh, you know, a lower stage to a higher stage. And uh, recurrence is quite common, um, you know, greater than 50%, even for the low risk tumors of low grade TA. Um, and recurrence uh, of CIS is, is very common. Uh, and that's why we're fortunate to have an effective treatment like BCG. Uh, but uh, for most of the papillary disease, progression is is, is more important concept because uh, you know a low grade TA tumor recurring but not progressing, it's not uh, you know life threatening. It's not posing a, a danger to the overall health, but uh, it's just a nuisance. Uh, but it, high grade TA disease progressing to T1 or muscle invasive disease or T1 progressing to muscle invasive disease, uh, even CIS progressing to muscle invasive disease, um, you know, significant proportion of those patients uh, some will end up uh, dying of bladder cancer. And so you can see that the rates of progression, um, you know, range from just basically 10 to 20% usually, uh, but T1 um, is a much higher uh, risk of progression to muscle invasive disease. Um, so there are, are different clinical uh, and pathologic features that you can use to predict the risks of recurrences and progression. Uh, a meta-analysis of different uh, randomized clinical trials from the ERTC was performed, uh, looking at different risk factors for recurrence and progression. Uh, sorry, I wouldn't call it a meta-analysis. They combined the data from the different uh, clinical trials and performed a new analysis uh, looking at risk factors for recurrence and progression. They identified, uh, you know, having a single tumor versus multiple tumors. Uh, if you had multiple, if you had uh, eight or more, that was uh, significantly worse than having two to seven. Uh, tumor size, whether or not the uh, patient had a history of recurrent disease and how frequently they recurred. Uh, and then uh, grade and stage, all of these factors played into the risks of recurrence and progression and you're able to put these together uh, into a, a risk score uh, that uh, can be stratified into uh, 
uh, low, medium, and high rates uh, or risks of either recurrence or progression. It's kind of cumbersome that, you know, there's a calculator now uh, that you can do uh, to do this, but uh, the AUA, um, so they showed that if you had the different uh, risk scores, your, your rates of recurrence at one year and five years and progression at one year and five years, uh, you know, stratified by those risk scores. Uh, but the AUA looks at this a little bit more simply um, and I think more practically. Um, and so dividing patients into low, intermediate, and high risk. Um, so low risk is basically only a solitary, small, low-grade uh, TA tumor or, or something less like pun lump. Uh, intermediate risk is uh, low-grade disease that's recurrent within a year, large low-grade disease, or multifocal low-grade disease. Um, there is, you know, rarely you will see low-grade uh, T1 or invasive disease. <clears throat> and the only high grade disease that falls into the intermediate risk category is a solitary, small, uh, high grade TA tumor. And the rest is high risk. So high grade T1 is obviously high risk. CIS is high risk. Recurrent high grade disease, large or multifocal high grade disease. And anytime that you have uh, a patient that recurs after BCG um, or um, you know, mention of variant histology, but you will very rarely see variant histology from a TUR uh, almost never in a, a low-grade disease and very rarely in a small high-grade disease. Uh, so mainly, you know, recurrent, large, multifocal, high-grade disease or high-grade T1, obviously. And uh, the way to use this uh, risk stratification is that uh, after TURBT, you remove the tumor and then the patient falls into the low risk category, um, no adjuvant treatment uh, is recommended. Uh, you would start to consider adjuvant treatment for intermediate risk, and definitely uh, you want to give out adjuvant treatment for patients in the high risk category. Um, every year I talk about the importance of TURBT, both for diagnostic and staging purposes, as well as the importance of a well performed TURBT uh, in terms of treatment. Um, it, you know, TURBT is the, is the first treatment that, and po possibly the only treatment that a patient with bladder cancer will undergo. Uh, so here are the, I'm just showing the, the newest, uh, NCCN guidelines, uh, but you're starting with TURBT and considering, uh, repeat TURBT in certain, uh, cases, which I'll talk about later. <clears throat> so TURBT, you know, many, many, you're, you're general urologists will, you know, do a handful here and there and uh, might even, you know, consider it a, a junior resident level case. Uh, but I think if you want to do a TURBT well, it's uh, one of the uh, more scary procedures that we do in urology, uh, you know, in terms of uh, there's always a uh, risk of perforation if you're, if you're trying to do a deep and wide resection. Uh, and um, sometimes uh, if you just go into the bladder and the bladder is filled with tumor, um, that can be a disorienting and, and difficult situation as well. But a small little tumor, uh, if you want, even if, even if it's small, if you want to do a good job, uh, you know, you have to, you have to be comfortable uh, uh, going, going deep into the bladder. Um, so there's some pictures that I sometimes show to patients to uh, tell, tell them what I'll be doing. Uh, but basically, I tell them I'm, I'm, I'm scraping away uh, the part of the bladder where the tumor is. And uh, I have a couple slides that Dr. Herr uh, used to show, uh, is that when you see the surface of the tumor, you have to wonder what's underneath the surface and consider the possibility that what's underneath the surface may extend laterally beyond uh, what you see on top, you know, kind of like an iceberg uh, type of analogy. Um, and when you're thinking in your mind, you know, how you're going to resect, um, think not only about how deep you're going to resect, but how, how wide uh, and laterally uh, around what you see as well. And uh, this is just another way of thinking about that, you know, a tumor might just be right underneath what you see on the surface and you just need to, if you could just, you know, cut it out like a piece of cake, uh, then that might be all that's needed. But uh, there are other cases where there are uh, branches of invasion. And so uh, you really want to 
go wide to make sure that you get anything underneath the surface that uh, you can't can't see that's and, and it might extend laterally. Um, restaging TUR, which uh, the AUA says should be considered uh, for all high grade patients. Um, it, you know, they recommend it more strongly if, uh, if it's a high grade TA patient without muscle in the first resection. Uh, but I think you should always consider uh, restaging it because uh, not only is restaging TUR important for uh, correctly staging the patient, but um, for oftentimes you'll remove residual disease, which uh, plays into how effectively uh, the combination of TUR plus minus adjuvant therapy is going to result in you know, disease-free survival. Um, this is a slide just looking at uh, different studies of restaging TUR. Uh, some of them focused only on patients with high-grade T1 patients. Uh, other studies uh, included uh, restaging TUR for patients initially diagnosed with uh, CIS or high-grade TA disease. Uh, and you can see, even for patients with CIS or high-grade TA, there was a significant proportion that were upstaged to T1 and some still even to T muscle invasive disease. Um, this study might have been uh, biased by the fact that uh, some of these patients were referred in after their first TUR. Uh, and so not only uh, may the, the first urologist may not have felt confident that they had resected everything. And so that's what, that's why they referred, or, uh, you know, they might, you know, the first TUR wasn't necessarily at a high volume center, but even at, even within your own patients at a high volume center, you're going to see, uh, you know, a significant proportion that had residual disease, uh, which is important. So, Look at these rates of residual T1 disease uh, in T1 patients, you know, basically 20, 25%. Uh, smaller percentage, 5 to 10% being uh, upstaged to muscle invasive disease. Uh, but if you're removing invasive disease, that's probably, you know, potentially changing the course of, of the outcome. So, like I, like I said, uh, Goals of restaging to UR, of course, we want to minimize understaging so that we are providing the right treatment recommendations uh, based upon accurate staging information. But the importance of uh, removing residual tumor uh, can't be understated. Um, and uh, I, always, I show this uh, clinical trial uh, every year. Uh, it was a kind of a unique clinical trial. It performed, uh, I forget which country in Eastern, Eastern Europe. Uh, but they, it was a randomized trial of patients with high-grade T1 disease who, uh, in, I think in the late 90s, were randomized to restaging TUR or not. Um, there were a small number of patients that they um, upstaged in the restaging group to muscle invasive disease, but it was fairly small, less than 10%. So uh, sh showing that they probably uh, did a decent job with their first TUR, but, uh, you know, Doing that repeat TUR, uh, they excluded the patients with muscle invasive disease uh, from the analyses. Uh, so doing that repeat TUR, you know, changed the, the curves for both recurrence and progression. Um, you know, 57% versus 32% recurrence-free survival difference at five years. Is this, uh, it was this done in a, in, a, in a cohort that received BCG or did anybody? BCG? They did receive BCG, yep. And that's going to segue into uh, intravesical therapy, which is uh, here on the uh, treatment guidelines. So intravesical therapy, um, you know, can be thought of in two settings, uh, peri perioperatively. Uh, so immediately after TUR or within the first 24 hours, uh, there are different agents that can be used. And then um, more commonly, um, adjuvant intravesical therapy like BCG given uh, a few weeks uh, after the TUR, uh, often weekly for six weeks uh, is, is how BCG came, came about. And that's uh, simply because that's how many vials came in the package. Uh, so mitomycin C has been around and used uh, for a long time perioperatively. Uh, it's been in the guidelines, uh, but not frequently utilized uh, you know, on a community level um, for various reasons. We, we used to use it uh, at Sloan Kettering uh, 
back when I was a junior resident here, we used to give it almost, uh, it seemed like all the time, because I remember, you know, going up to the PACU and, and giving it and clamping the catheter, et cetera. But uh, we use it a lot less frequently uh, because there were some rare instances of just really bad peritoneal uh, side effects. Uh, and, you know, that was probably in cases where there was a micro perforation that it didn't know about. Uh, but some patients, you know, by report, none of my, I haven't given it very frequently to my patients in a perioperative fashion, but uh, some of the doctors here will talk about patients who had uh, severe pain and chronic pain and uh, uh, for many, many months or, or year after, after that type of uh, treatment. And other, other agents have also been used in the perioperative setting, um, but the meta-analyses of the, the data show that the real benefit is really only for minimizing recurrence and really only beneficial in the low risk patients. So uh, with a small solitary low grade tumors was really the only group of patients that had a significant benefit. And in that group, you're minimizing recurrence, but that's, like I said, more of a nuisance in the low risk patients than a danger, and uh, so perhaps you want to reconsider um, using it uh, because you you know in, in, a, in a small percentage of patients they're going to have a, a complete change to their quality of life if they have uh, you know that type of cystitis uh, or peritoneal uh, irritation. Uh, but there is a good alternative uh, you know that's been studied and shown to be effective as well. Uh, gemcitabine uh, seems to be much better tolerated. Um, and so well, we seem, we give it here frequently perioperatively in, the, in those low risk patients. Um, the, but this was a randomized trial that was uh, published a couple of years ago looking at perioperative intravesical gemcitabine. But uh, more, more, I think more importantly from my perspective, uh, adjuvant intravesical therapies, um, trying to reduce the risks of both recurrence and progression uh, in the intermediate and high-risk patients. So I'll talk a little bit about BCG, which remains uh, the best, the most effective agent that we have. Uh, and uh, we desperately need something new to come along. I'll talk about things that ha uh, have recently come out, but I'm not overly optimistic about how successful they'll be long-term. Um, Interferons have been used uh, as intravesical adjuvant therapy, and that's, uh, you know, that's what's utilized in the uh, instiladrin gene therapy. So I'll talk about that at the end. Um, and a variety of different chemotherapeutic agents have been used in intravesical adjuvant fashion. Uh, some, of, some of these have been tested, you know, in the BCG failure setting. So, uh, we did a study of uh, intravesical gemcitabine in patients with uh, recurrent CIS after BCG. Valrubicin is uh, the, the one that's been FDA approved for a long time in patients who are unfit or declined cystectomy who have recurrent uh, disease after C BCG. Um, and the folks at Columbia and um, you know, other centers uh, are studying different combinations of sequential chemotherapies uh, in the BCG failure setting as well. Um, just showing the slide again, saying that we're considering adjuvant intravesical therapy um, in the intermediate risk category, definitely using uh, adjuvant intravesical therapy for the high risk category and BCG is strongly preferred for high risk and BCG is also preferred for uh, high grade disease uh, in the intermediate risk. Uh, we frequently will use mitomycin or gemcitabine uh, in the adjuvant setting for recurrent or, or you know, multifocal uh, low-grade patients. Uh, so BCG uh, has been around for many decades, uh, studied in many randomized clinical trials. Uh, you can see from the quality of this figure that it was uh, a couple decades ago when it was published, um, but BCG changes uh, the clinical course for patients with high-grade bladder cancer. And uh, here's a table that combines or summarizes a few different of the clinical trials. You can see the first ones in the 80s and, and the rest in the 90s, basically. All were uh, statistically significant, showing a benefit of BCG. 
uh, and you can see the magnitude of that benefit is pretty significant. Uh, this is just a long-term follow-up of one of the Dr. Herr's uh, randomized clinical trial, uh, just showing 10-year follow-up for these patients. And you can see that these curves are significantly different in terms of uh, progression-free survival and overall survival. So uh, I'm going to talk about, for one slide, radical cystectomy for non-muscle invasive disease. It's a topic that you could spend a whole hour on. Uh, but I'll leave that for uh, another day or uh, someone else to give. Uh, but there are frequently scenarios in which you consider radical cystectomy for non-muscle invasive disease. Um, so for high-risk T1 disease, uh, radical cystectomy is often considered. Uh, so high-risk T1 would be multi multifocal invasive disease. Uh, or residual invasive disease after a you know, when you restage the patient, those are high risk features. Um, and there are studies, you know, showing, showing why that they're high risk features. Uh, if there's diffuse CIS in the bladder, uh, along with high grade T1, uh, you want to consider cystectomy. Um, of course, we'll talk about, uh, cystectomy as the standard of care for BCG unresponsive disease. And I'll go through what the definition of uh, BCG unresponsive is, um, and patients with, uh, you know, multiply recurrent disease or patients that you don't think that you were able to, you know, completely resect and stage the tumor. Um, for all of these patients, you should consider uh, cystectomy. Let's talk a little bit about recurrence after uh, BCG and, and different definitions. Um, I'll skip over that. And so, the, you know, the alternatives for the options for, you know, treatment of recurrent disease uh, after BCG, depending upon the scenario. So sometimes you'll consider a second course of BCG, and that's probably more likely in a scenario where someone's got high-grade TA disease, uh, they're resected, they get BCG, and then 18 months later or you know, two and a half years later, and they have re recurrent disease. And again, it's TA. Um, so that's kind of the most common scenario in which we think that a second course of BCG, uh, second induction course of BCG would be effective. Uh, less likely to be effective, you know, in CIS uh, that recurs in a short time period, for example. And that's, I'll go through some of the uh, different cut points that are included in the definition. Um, like I mentioned, there's many groups looking at intravesical chemotherapy and combinations and sequentially, et cetera, uh, in patients who recur after BCG. Um, radical cystectomy is uh, the standard of care for true BCG unresponsive disease. And so uh, BCG unresponsive disease, is, which I'll define in, in a minute, um, the reason that they want to call something BCG unresponsive, it's the group of patients who we think are very unlikely to benefit from any additional BCG. So BCG is just not going to work in that group of patients. And that's why um, other, other therapies are needed. And setting that definition allowed, uh, which was done with the FDA, uh, allowed companies and groups to design clinical trials uh, in a manner that led to approval, uh, like pembrolizumab, even though didn't really have spectacular results. So broader term of BCG failure uh, is just, you know, recurrent or persistent high-grade disease after BCG. But uh, historically, there were many different groups, uh, you know, BCG refractory, BCG resistant, BCG relapsing, and BCG intolerant. And I always found it hard to remember uh, what the difference between refractory, resistant, and relapsing were. Intolerance is pretty easy. It could, they couldn't tolerate it because of side effects. But... Uh, so BCG refractory is basically uh, they're recurring early. So they have not become disease-free within six months or they've progressed, uh, you know, early on. BCG resistant is uh, less severe. So they might have had recurrent or persistent disease uh, early, but it didn't, it was no longer, you were able to get rid of it and it was no longer present at the six month time point and it, and it had not progressed. Uh, and then BCG relapsing was basically recurring 
later uh, within you know the six to 12 month mark would be the er early relapsing. So you're able to get a complete response at three or six months, but then uh, it you know recurred later. And like I said, BCG intolerant is just that they couldn't get the, the full course or close to a full course of BCG because of side effects. Um, and this is just a, a curve from a paper published in 2001 looking at uh, Sloan Kettering experience when they switched. So early on, uh, they used to keep giving BCG and uh, even for recurrent T1 disease and uh, before we knew better and um, only proceeding with cystectomy when uh, they progressed to muscle invasive disease. Uh, but they found that, so that was the delayed cystectomy group here. They found that, you know, pretty dismal results, uh, you know, much worse than patients with muscle invasive disease that go on to immediate cystectomy. Um, but then when they switched and, and defined high-risk T1 patients or, or patients that should undergo uh, cystectomy recurrent CIS or, uh, you know, that met the BCG failure criteria or recurrent T1 disease uh, after BCG, when they started performing cystectomy earlier in those patients, uh, you know, they did significantly better. Like I had alluded to, uh, the FDA and many uh, clinicians came together um, to define what a group of patients that would not benefit for BC from further BCG therapy and to provide uh, definitions of this group that could be used in clinical trials. Uh, and so they, we came up with a definition of BCG unresponsive uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, and that's uh, you know the population of patients in which the clinical trial of pembrolizumab, for example, was used. So persistent or recurrent CIS or with or without other disease uh, within 12 months of completion of adequate BCG therapy, and I underlined adequate BCG therapy because there's a separate definition of what's considered adequate, um, or uh, recurrent TA, non-invasive papillary disease, or T1 disease within six months of completion of adequate BCG therapy, or if you have recurrent T1 disease at the first evaluation after, after the BCG. Um, and so what's adequate BCG therapy? It's defined as receiving at least five out of the six uh, doses from the initial induction course, plus at least two out of three uh, from uh, maintenance, or uh, you know five out of six uh, doses of the initial induction course, plus at least two more of a second induction course. And it's important uh, to know this definition when you're, you know, trying to in, in ensure clinical trial eligibility, for example. Uh, so the treatment options for BCG unresponsive disease, which we just defined, radical cystectomy uh, is the standard of care. Um, but the, those clinical trials, uh, looking at other, uh, other therapies like pembrolizumab, uh, they defined it so patients with BCG unresponsive disease who were either declined or were unfit for cystectomy. And so that's how they kind of work around it. Um, but it's, it, it'll be interesting to see what urologists and uh, medical oncologists in the community, uh, how they really use it. Are they really pushing uh, radical cystectomy for those patients and really only if the patients decline or are they saying, hey, we've got this other great option. We're going to do an infusion of pembrolizumab and we're going to make you all better. Uh, and other, so I'm listing other bladder preserving strategies for these patients. You know, we talked about the uh, different chemotherapeutic, intravesical chemotherapy regimens that are being tried, but they're not really being studied in, a, in a, any kind of fashion that's going to lead to, uh, you know, approval. Um, there are other ways of delivering chemotherapy, like heating it up or uh, electromotive administration, trying to see if those delivery methods uh, increase efficacy within the bladder. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, instiladrin uh, or uh, you know, gene therapy uh, to allow for interferon delivery for, for a prolonged period of time. Uh, so first, uh, some of the things that have been uh, more, more tried and uh, are, are more common in use. Uh, so like I mentioned, valrubicin is FDA approved for uh, recurrent uh, disease after BCG. 
we published a study on uh, gemcitabine, Dr. Dalbani led it, um, in patients with BCG on responsive disease with CIS. Um, but look at this curve, it, it, you know, no, recurrence free survival at a year, it's around 20%. That's pretty, pretty poor. Um, so half 50% of patients will initially respond, but the, the number that remain a complete response at a year is very low. And uh, so a significant proportion of patients end up, end up going on to have cystectomy. Uh, docetaxel has also been studied. Um, you know, the Columbia group uh, published a lot on docetaxel. Um, again, you know, 50 to 60% initially responding, but after a year or two, uh, that curve is really down around 25%. And uh, disease-specific survival, you know, there are some patients who progress and die of disease. So finally, I'll just get to uh, the new treatments that have been approved. So the FDA approved pembrolizumab, so systemic immunotherapy for the BCG unresponsive group. Uh, and this uh, approval was made based upon the results of uh, the Keynote 057 trial. And so it was looking uh, at the 96 patients who had BCG unresponsive CIS uh, disease, not uh, the remainder of patients who were enrolled in the trial who just had uh, papillary disease. So we're talking about those 96 patients and 41% of them had a complete response at the three month time point. And then, uh, but this curve is the curve that they frequently show, which uh, it's kind of misleading. It's, it's, this is showing uh, the patients remaining in complete response. So it's only looking at the 41% of patients who initially had a complete response and then showing how many of them remain uh, uh, complete response. So it's like 50% of 41%, which, which is what it shows here. Uh, only 19% of patients <laughs> had a complete response and uh, at, at one year. Uh, so it's a very uh, misleading curve. It's, it's the curve only in those 41% of patients who were initially complete responders. But nevertheless, uh, with a 19% one-year uh, response rate, uh, this was approved for BCG unresponsive uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer patients who are declining or are unfit for radical cystectomy. And, and then the other uh, recent- Just out of curiosity about Pembro, yeah. do we have any uh, data on Pembro in patients who have not been exposed to BCG? Is there anything like that out there? I mean, obviously BCG- I don't, no, I, no I, don't, I don't think, I don't think that there are any, there are clinical trials that are being developed and, and started uh, for, you know, as the initial uh, adjuvant therapy. Um, but no, I mean, and you'd really, it's really hard to ethically figure out the right group of patients uh, to offer, you know, something like Pembro, uh, which can have serious side effects um, when there is a fairly, um, you know, BCG is, is, is very effective and, and fairly well tolerated. So the last uh, potential treatment option that I'll talk about is instiladrin, which uh, the data for, from which were just published by uh, the first author was uh, Cornell grad, Steve Borgen. Um, so interferons have been uh, used in the, inside the bladder uh, for many decades in bladder cancer. Um, and so they're, they're well tolerated and effective, but the responses like many of the other uh, treatments for recurrent disease, they weren't durable. And so uh, a group of um, scientists wanted to look at, uh, you know, ways of de delivering uh, gene therapy, uh, basically to, to the bladder. Uh, so they use a non-replicating adenovirus uh, based system um, that delivers uh, the genes for both uh, interferon alpha and for uh, SYN3, which is a surfactant that en enhances the transduction of the virus into the urethelium. And uh, their trial, um, multi-center trial, included um, 157 patients that were enrolled. Um, and then they focus upon the, the subgroup uh, with CIS uh, 
components because uh, a lot of you know studies with just high grade TA disease that include patients with high grade TA disease at the time of their uh, recurrence or as part of their BCG unresponsive definition, um, it's hard to TUR alone will sometimes or often lead to an initial complete response. And so uh, many of the analyses focus like the pembrolizumab uh, subgroup focus on the subgroup with the CIS. And so they uh, ended up analyzing 103 of those patients uh, who underwent TUR, were found to meet the criteria, and then they got this, you know, the first dose of this uh, intravesical um, adenovirus gene, gene therapy. Um, and at the three-month mark, or at the first evaluation, uh, about half of them had a complete response, so 55 out of 103. Um, but predictably, uh, at each time point, uh, there were uh, a number of patients, 13, 5, 11, who ended up recurring um, along the way. And so they ended up with about uh, 25, they ended up with 25 patients who were recurrence free from high grade disease. Uh, You're allowed to have a low grade recurrence uh, at the one year mark. And so 25 out of 103, again, uh, basically leading us down to similar type of uh, you know, one year recurrence free survival that uh, all these curves seem to show. Although they, again, the pembrolizumab curve looks higher, but it's because they're only looking at the subset of patients who initially responded. And so uh, about half of patients had a complete response at the three month mark, but this dropped off down to 24% at the one year mark. But it's, uh, you know, it, it's exciting because it's a, a, a new, um, delivery system, um, but you know, still I'm not very uh, optimistic about you know, what it means for the majority of patients with BCG unresponsive bladder cancer. Uh, but again, this is, this is the curve that they show in the Lancet Oncology article for Instiladrin. Um, but again, it's, they, they've, learned, they've learned the trick to show the curve in patients who had a complete response at three months. And so it looks like it's 40%, but really it's 25, 24%. Uh, in conclusion, uh, radical cystectomy is the standard of care for BCG unresponsive non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Pembrolizumab was FDA approved uh, last year. Uh, and Stiladrin, uh, you know, data is published. So pot likely to be also be FDA approved uh, based upon the, the low cut point that's been established by pembrolizumab. Uh, but I think it's really, really important to either do novel clinical trials, we need to kind of break the, the mold and think outside the box, um, or uh, you really need to, you know, push radical cystectomy in, in patients who are, you know, fit for, fit for surgery and have true BCG unresponsive disease. Um, you know, uh, by clinical trials or looking at different chemotherapy combinations uh, in patients who are really motivated to try to keep their bladder. I think that's it. That's all I have.